Okay, dzień dobry. To jest słyszalne. Halo, halo. Słychać, tak? E, witam chyba w większości osoby przed, e, e, przed e, e, komputerami niż na e, sali w wersji hybrydowej dzisiejsze e, seminarium e, naukowe i dzisiejszym gościem jest e, e, dr e, Potza. Now I will switch to English and introduce our guest. Uh, Dr. Potza is a senior researcher at the University of Siena. He's also a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist trained in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy at the psychology unit of the Santa Maria alla Scotta University Hospital at Siena. Uh, Andrea uh, has published several research papers, books, or uh, book chapters in the field of obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and the treatments of this um, uh, mental disorders. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Potza will present us a talk, uh, will give us a lecture on um, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Okay, Jean Dobre, thank you very much for being here. I would like to thank Professor Wojciech Dragan and Professor Magojata Dragan for hosting me in this very nice city. It's a great opportunity for an international exchange for me. And today, I will try to do my best to talk about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, sorry how can I skip a slide this one I think it doesn't work This one, okay. this one, perhaps, okay, this one, perfect, thank you so much. So welcome to this lecture, CBT for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, I work at uh, the University of Siena, uh, it's a quite small city in Tuscany, and uh, particularly I work as a psychotherapist at the university hospital. In these pictures, uh, you can see our hospital and uh, the key points today. We will try to do our best to depict the clinical picture of PTSD, the available evidence about the effectiveness of CBT for this psychopathological condition. Um, I will try to give you some clinical tips, some psychotherapeutic techniques, for treating patients with PTSD. And finally, I will try to provide you with some future challenges. <clears throat> As you know, PTSD, according to the American Psychiatric Association, is a complex uh, cl clinical condition consisting of uh, uh, several symptoms that arise from a traumatic event that involved, for example, an aggression, a sexual or a physical assault, a car accident, a war. And the clinical picture consists of re-experiencing re symptoms, including flashbacks, intrusive memories, mental images, and nightmares. Associated with a state of over-vigilance, uh, uh, 
arousal and also an alteration in the cognitive system of the person. The person thinks that uh, it's all my fault. I am a, a defeated person. Uh, I am mad. I can't trust people. The world is bad. Um, all these symptoms are associated with avoidant behaviors. So the person engages in avoidant behaviors in order to prevent the occurrence of intrusive th symptoms. And lastly, uh, the person can experience a low negative mood as a consequence of the avoidance behavior. In children and adolescents, the clinical picture is quite non-specific. So we have, for example, physiological symptoms, loss of appetite, sleep problems, nightmares. Uh, because children have low metacognitive capacities that can allow them to express their feelings. During adolescence, we can see more complex symptoms. Um, specifically related to social relationships. So, for example, social isolation, social fears, and any other difficulties related to adolescent functioning. So, for example, difficulty concentrating. And also, compensatory behaviors engaged in order to regulate negative emotions. For example, alcohol or drug abuse. So it's a quite um, non-specific clinical picture. OK. In association with this picture, we can see uh, coping strategies. The person uh, with the aim to cope strong, unpleasant feelings can worry or ruminate. Worry is a coping strategy is typically starting with what if while rumination is a cognitive thinking style uh, more oriented to past events. It's a chaining where one thought or memory triggers the next thought, then the next thought, until sometimes you can't remember when you started. Okay, worry and rumination are strategies involved in the maintenance of PTSD symptoms. And both of them involved a chain of thoughts and mental images negatively affected because they are relatively uncontrollable. While worry is oriented to future events, rumination is dedicated to past uh, situations. More recently, the international classification system of diseases, the 11th version introduced a new diagnostic category, the complex PTSD diagnosis, which involves classical symptoms of PTSD, so re-experiencing memories, avoidance behaviors, uh, altered cognitive um, effects, but in addition to the core symptoms of PTSD, we can also observe more complex features. So for example, a more complex negative self-concept where the person thinks she or he is defeated, is a bad person. Difficulties concerning emotional regulation and also difficulties related to interpersonal relationships. What about the course? and gender differences. We know that uh, around 20 to 50 percent of patients experience a stable recovery within three to seven years, while the remaining individuals tend to face a chronic course. Women are more likely to have a PTSD after a trauma and regardless of the type of the traumatic event. According to some data, female sex is associated with specific 
symptom clusters. So for example, amongst women, we can more often observe a higher physiological reactivity to reminders and also avoidance and numbing, numbing or depressive symptoms. Other data suggest that women have more general PTSD severity than men. So women are more severe in general. Okay, so uh, early intervention is the key. According to a recent meta-analysis, as you know, a meta-analysis is a research uh, study when you can collect the data from previously published papers and pull the data through statistic uh, methods. The mean remission rates at follow-up were around 40%. But this percentage varied from 8 to 90%, a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous percentage, depending upon time of first treatment. So the phase when the person is under treatment is the key. According to the data of this meta-analysis, in studies with the baseline within the first five months following trauma, remission rate was around 50%, as compared to around 30% in studies with baseline later. So if we can engage the patient earlier, we can achieve remission earlier. So early intervention is very, very important. This is a study we conducted with victims of terrorist attacks. And the question is here, does the type of the event affect the symptom or the clusters of symptoms of PTSD? Um, the response here is yes, at least according to our data. Uh, in our sample of victims of terrorist attacks, we found that those patients who had experienced terrorist attacks had significantly more severe avoidance and depressive symptoms, detached feelings, and more general PTSD severity than victims of other traumas. For example, that of a loved one, a car accident. We speculated that the type of the event can have a role in uh, affecting the clinical picture of the, per the person. According to our hypothesis, the intentional nature of the arm, like a terrorist attack, could uh, produce a more severe clinical picture, so more severe symptoms than a uh, uh, random car accident. Okay. In another study, conducted at Howard University, we found also that um, a terrorist attack was associated with a higher risk of oncological diseases than other types of events. So the type of the event could also increase the likelihood of specific medical disorders as outcomes of PTSD. This is a study we conducted with victims of terrorist attacks as compared with victims of other types of traumas. Okay. Do you have any questions here? All is, all is clear? Okay, thank you. If you have questions, don't hesitate to stop me and I will give my response. I will do my best to provide any 
uh, clearer information regarding the presentation. Okay, the CBT model. The CBT model has been developed by Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck during the 50s, just after the Second World War. They work particularly back with uh, soldiers after the Second World War. He saw specifically patients and veterans with PTSD and depressive disorders. They felt guilty for the war and they uh, saw that how our mind uh, typically works as follows. We can face a situation, so for example, uh, an interview, a job interview, or a date, a party, a war, a car accident. Um, during this situation, we can experience automatic thoughts, mental images, which in turn can produce emotional feelings. Then uh, these feelings can produce behavioral responses. So this is the so-called ABC model, activating event, beliefs, and emotional and behavioral consequences. Okay, so if we apply this model to PTSD, we can have the so-called cognitive triangle. This is a key uh, picture we can show to our patients. Um, our mind, when we face a trauma, when we get entrapped in a trauma, can works can work as follows. Thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So you can see here, for example, a patient with PTSD can experience thoughts, including, it's all my fault, I had to protect myself, I am defeated, I can't trust people. Then uh, he or she can experience fear, disgust, guilt, shame, emotions. And finally, behavioral responses, so avoidance of thoughts, of reminders of the trauma, and rituals. I, have that, I had a patient who had uh, washing rituals after a sexual assault. So the CBT model of PTSD has been developed by Hellers and Clark at the University of Oxford during the 80s. As you see here, uh, the traumatic event represents the trigger situation that activates memories of trauma, beliefs about myself, about other people and the world. And this creates a um, current sense of threat that is reinforced by avoidant behaviors. So avoidance here is the key maintenance factor of PTSD. As we will see later, uh, most of the CBT intervention is dedicated to avoidance. Okay? Does it make a sense? Okay. Okay, how our anxiety works as follows. This is the natural curve of anxiety. If we are exposed to an anxiety evoking situation, our anxiety can arise then after some minutes or some hours, it can decrease. So this is the physiological curve of anxiety. But due to avoidance behaviors, the patient with PTSD does not reach the so-called habituation because avoidance reinforces new anxiety whenever he or she faces new reminders or new uh, trauma-related situations. 
Professor Edna Foa is a professor from Israeli. She is currently uh, working in the United States at Boston, I see. Uh, she has developed uh, a kind of CBT therapy dedicated to PTSD victims, the so-called prolonged imaginal exposure therapy. It's a kind of exposure therapy where the therapist is uh, trying to expose or encourage the patient to expose him or herself to reminders in a prolonged period through imagination. So this creates the habituation process that prevents the um, occurrence of avoidance behaviors. So here are some key instructions regarding the uh, imaginal exposure therapy. So you need to go back in your mind uh, to the trauma. You can divide the traumatic event in pieces in little parts according to a hierarchy from the less uh, anxious uh, details of the trauma to the most anxious details. You need to create, to develop a hierarchy of uh, anxiety evoking reminders in collaboration with the patient, then, then you need to expose the patient through uh, imagination or writing, for example. You can record the writing of the reminder of the memory, then the patient can listen repeatedly the reminder. It's very important that the patient uh, keeps his or her eyes closed and you need to describe the event as if it's happening now. So it's very important the nowness, the vividness of the memory. So for example, you need to include in the, uh, in the tale, in the script, of the memory, uh, specific details, sensory details, uh, dressing, clothes, people around you, uh, at least uh, less important details. Everything is important in this script in order to create a realistic reminder for the patient. Okay, this is an example of exposure hierarchy applied to um, car accident related to PTSD. And it's, it's a mixed exposure, imaginal and in vivo exposure. So you can uh, use imaginal exposure for certain types of traumas, for example, war, related traumas. For other types of traumas, for example, a car accident, you can uh, include also in vivo elements. Okay, uh, this is a meta-analysis published in 2014 by this uh, Dutch research group in 16 studies with around 1,000 1, participants, they found significant effect sizes favoring trauma-focused CBT as compared to non-active or active non-trauma-focused control conditions. So trauma-focused CBT appears to be more effective than another psychotherapy without traumatic elements, without a traumatic focus. So it's very important that the focus of your protocol is on the trauma if you want to treat PTSD. And they found 
positive effects specifically for trauma-related cognitions. So the cognitive system of the person related to the trauma. I can't trust people, I am mad, I am bad, I am unlovable. So here are some evidence about the efficacy of trauma CBT for PTSD. Modern virtual reality exposure therapy is also effective. This, this is another way to deliver CBT and particularly for children. For example, you can apply this modality to PTSD related to dental visits in children. For, so for example, for PTSD in children related to uh, the dentist. Okay, so just keep on the CBT model. This is the next step. Uh, the question here is why not all the people develop PTSD after a trauma? Some statistics suggest that around 30% of people developed this clinical condition after a traumatic situation. According to some psychotherapists, during the last 20, 30 years, a role is played by the so-called early maladaptive schemas. Uh, Jeffrey Young is a psychotherapist from New York and he has integrated the CBT model by adding the concept of early maladaptive schemas. These schemas are interpersonal memories cognitions, emotions, bodily sensations that can activate in an automatic manner since our childhood, since our adolescence. They are closely related to our parental relationships. So our schemas are related to how our parents treated us. So let's go beyond the cognitive triangle. According to Young, uh, early maladaptive schemas can develop when one or more of these universal basic needs are frustrated or are too much met. Safety and acceptance needs. Play needs, autonomy needs. When we are children, all of us need to be uh, satisfied, need to be cared uh, regarding these universal needs. When one or more of these needs are not satisfied or they are too much satisfied, we can develop early maladaptive schemas. And according to uh, Young uh, conceptualization, we have 18 early maladaptive schemas. They are grouped into five categories according to the frustration of uh, each one of the five needs. So if uh, my autonomy need is frustrated, I can develop a failure schema or a dependence schema or a vulnerability schema. Does it make a sense? Here are some examples of schemas. The schema I am unlovable. When my needs of care, acceptance and safety were not met during childhood. 
the schema people will always abandon me the schema i can't trust people the schema i'll be a failure when my uh, competence feelings are not satisfied by my parents if my parents don't trust me i don't trust me as well the schema self sacrifice the defectiveness and shame schema this is a quite famous statement from groucho marx i think it's quite uh, depicts the defectiveness and shame schema and finally, the entitlement and grandiosity schema. When your needs have been too much satisfied by your parents. So you think that you are superior to other people. You are entitled to special rights or uh, you, you, you can have insistence that uh, other people uh, should meet your needs whenever you want. Okay, but um, our interpersonal schemas represent our deepest interpersonal scripts. When we see patients during our clinical practice, we more properly see another form of coping strategies, the so-called Cognitive distortions. Aaron Beck introduced the concept of cognitive distortion, and they can be seen as a pair of glass that doesn't work correctly. Correct, um, cognitive distortions represent unrealistic views of ourselves, of people, and the world. Here are some examples. So, for example, all or nothing thinking, overgeneralizing, and jumping to conclusions, magnification or minimization, catastrophizing. These are uh, mental uh, errors, mental traps that protect how that protect us against stressors, but they are unrealistic. And they typically confirm our schemas, okay? One of the most uh, common um, cognitive distortion often involved in PTSD is anxiety sensitivity. Anxiety sensitivity represents a cognitive bias related to the outcomes of the signals of arousal. So, for example, we can uh, see three types of sensitivity. Physical concerns, so the belief that palpitations, for example, can lead to a heart attack. Social concerns, the belief that observable anxiety feelings and reaction will elicit social rejection and cognitive concerns the belief that cognitive difficulties so for example memory or concentration difficulties will lead to mental defeats okay so in summary this is the cbt model and According to the CBT model, the external part of our mind is represented by behaviors. They are overt manifestations of our mind. The branches in this tree are emotions. If I ask some patients how they feel, they can say to me they feel crazy, they feel guilty, they feel sad, etc. 
The lag is cognition, so the cognitive style, and the deepest part of how our mind is represented by the interpersonal schemas. So we need to very carefully focus on the patient to understand his or her schemas because the interpersonal schemas are the deepest part of our mind. Okay, applying all of this to PTSD, some evidence suggested that uh, the interpersonal schemas, the interpersonal scripts can activate during situations similar to a specific traumatic event. So for example, in this British experimental research on 115 children, they found that those children who had experienced, witnessed parental conflicts, so this was the traumatic event, they felt more jealousy, more anger, anxiety, and uh, reject fears, also aggressive and avoidance behaviors, during role-playing exercises as compared with the peers who had not been exposed to uh, parental conflicts. So during these role plays, the children felt uh, the same emotions they had felt during the parental conflicts. Okay, so, does it make a sense? Thank you. So, the CBT techniques. The uh, aim of this presentation will, will be to uh, introduce the most important CBT techniques starting from the CBT model. I, I will not talk about EMDR or imagery rescripting. These are third waves uh, forms of CBT techniques. I will try to focus specifically on trauma focused CBT according to the model I have explained uh, earlier. So first of all, a key point is providing psychoeducation. And when we have a PTSD victim, we need to explain what PTSD is, the symptoms, all the phases related to grief, for example, the emotions, according to the cognitive triangle I have shown you before. The, the second step is recognizing, identifying the automatic thoughts of the patient by some worksheets, for example, the thought recording diary. And then we need to focus on the cognitive distortions of the patient and trying to address, to challenge these distortions in order to help the patient to restructure his or her uh, distortions. This is a list, uh, I think it's a useful list of Socratic questioning. These are questions you can use during your practice as a psychotherapist in order to challenge the cognitions of your patients related to his or her trauma. So, for example, what is the evidence supporting this idea? What is the evidence against this idea? Is there an alternative explanation? Okay, uh, when we have a patient with PTSD, we need to focus on PTSD-related distortions. So, for example, a patient with PTSD might show an appraisal of the traumatic event. So, for example, he or she could believe this could happen again, or I should have been able to prevent it or to protect myself. 
we need to focus on appraisals of symptoms. These are quite similar to the so-called metacognitions of PTSD. So the fear of going mad due to the PTSD picture. Another way to target PTSD symptoms is to target the coping, the maladaptive coping strategies. One has, we have seen earlier, one of the coping strategies is worry. Worry about future events or rumination about past events, specifically the trauma. And worry time is a quite uh, interesting um, exercise introduced by Thomas Borkovitz. You need to uh, choose a um, specific time of the day, for example, 30 minutes, uh, when the patient can worry. But the patient can worry or ruminate only during these minutes. So, for example, at 7 p.m. And when the patient feels the occurrence of automatic thoughts, that can lead to rumination or worry, he or she is encouraged to postpone the thoughts to the 7 p.m. Uh, worry time. It's not time to worry yet. Particularly if the thoughts are related to something, something which is not in my control. As we have seen before, anxiety sensitivity is uh, a cognitive distortion involved in PTSD, so the fear of anxiety. And we can use exposure therapy to target this distortion by exposing the patient to, for example, specific arousal signals. So, for example, if the patient fears cardiac symptoms, a specific interoceptive exposure tasks could uh, be related to running in place, stair climbing, ingestion of caffeine or herbal stimulants, with the aim to induce heart racing, heart pounding, breathlessness, and sweating. Those uh, arousal symptoms the patient fear. Okay, in some patients we can see also PTSD related, related agoraphobia. This is an example of agoraphobia hierarchy when you can uh, create a step-by-step -step, uh, classification of the fears of the patient from the most distressing to the least distressing situations. We can use cognitive restructuring based on Socratic questioning in order to address and challenge uh, maladaptive cognitions related to panic. So if, for example, if the patient uh, fears uh, the feeling of light head, we can try to ask the patient other possible outcomes. So, for example, I might not faint. I never have before. I feel light-headed because I am anxious, etc. Another uh, trait, vulnerability factor in PTSD is perfectionism. This is a pre-traumatic trait, I think, 
which can interact with the trauma. If a person is perfectionist, when faces a trauma, she or he have a higher probability of developing a PTSD. So, for example, self-blame feelings associated with complex PTSD can be associated with a perfectionist personality. So here are some uh, clinical tips of cognitive restructuring. So, for example, this cognitive restructuring technique can be used to address the self-blame and maladaptive self-judgment. And, for example, I, I can ask the patient, when you're judging yourself harshly, try to ask, what would I say to a friend who was judging herself this way? Okay, a, a good strategy to identify the early maladaptive schemas is the following one. Um, we need to conduct a Socratic questioning where we, we try to help the patient to focus the meaning of the trauma. So, for example, we can ask the patient, what does the, is, this event mean to you? Why is it so traumatic? Why is it so important. Which is the worst outcome associated with this trauma for you? And which is the best outcome associated with this trauma? This is a kind of post-traumatic uh, growth. Okay, and uh, finally, um, we need to uh, work hard with the patient uh, regarding the, the self-blame feelings. As we have seen before, um, most of the cognitions regarding the self are related to self-blame. I am guilty, I am ashamed, I am mad, it's all my fault. So. Um, a good way to address these feelings and this cognitive style is to introduce a self-compassion letter. Self-compassion letter is a good way when the patient can write to her or his self as a friend, as a gentle, kind, warm friend. And so, for example, Imagine that there is someone who loves and accepts you unconditionally for who you are. What would that person say to you about this part of yourself, of your history? This is a good way to create a warm feeling in the patient and help the patient to talk, to have a self-talk uh, very warm, very gentle, uh, with the aim to reduce self-blame regarding trauma. Um, other more emotional techniques are based upon the use of metaphors. So this is an act metaphor. Uh, one of the most recent developments of CBT is acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is the tug of war metaphor, where you can um, help the patient to learn that control is the problem, not the solution. Imagine that your trauma is like a monster and you are trying to uh, face this monster to struggle this monster, but this struggle is very unpleasant for you. It's very distressing. 
So the solution is avoiding control the trauma. This is a video from, uh, I think, Russ Harris, one of the founders of the ACT perspective. So if you want to, you can see the video. It's very informative. According to the ACT perspective, we can also work with the values of the patient. So we, we need to uh, help the patient to focus on his or her values as uh, parent, partner, student. So we can ask the patient, what type of parent would you like to be? Does the avoidance behavior help you in reaching this uh, objective? And lastly, some evidence. According to this very recent meta-analysis published in 2020 by the group of Catherine Lewis and Jonathan Bisson, they found that the strongest evidence of effect was for the studies broadly categorized as trauma-focused CBT. So CBT with a trauma focus showed a positive effect when compared with wait list or treatment as usual. The effectiveness of trauma focused CBT was quite similar to EMDR. And also trauma focused CBT was effective in both individual and group formats. So I think this is one of the most recent evidence about the efficacy of trauma focus CBT. And finally, if we compare a trauma focus CBT with medications, in this double randomized preference trial, uh, the authors found that patients typically prefer CBT than uh, sertraline or other antidepressants. Both of them, uh, psychotherapy and medications, are effective and the effectiveness is kept over 24 months, but patients uh, more often prefer psychotherapy. And the effectiveness also regards uh, not only PTSD-related symptoms, but depression, anxiety, and functioning. So a lot of different outcomes. So in conclusions, uh, some open issues here for the future. Uh, I have tried to provide a short but I hope informative photo of the CBT techniques, particularly trauma-focused CBT. And according to my knowledge, we, we don't really know uh, if trauma-focused CBT is more effective for some PTSD patients than other PTSD patients. So, for example, we need to uh, know if patients with comorbidities can respond to this treatment. We need to know if the delivery modality is the key. So, for example, does internet-based CBT work in the same manner as uh, in-office CBT? And also, another important point regards the therapeutic process. Does trauma-focused CBT really affect the vulnerability factors involved in the development of PTSD?